Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for having us here. And uh, delighted to be here and talk uh, about neuropathy and uh, sleep disorders. Um, in the words of Dalai Lama, sleep is the best form of meditation. Uh, does anybody have a clue as to when sleep disorders really worsened in time? The electric light? Absolutely right. So it was actually Thomas Edison in 1879, and he, you know, had the uh, discovered uh, the electric bulb, and that's where, you know, we have a lot of uh, where uh, the normal circadian rhythms with, uh, you know, sleep and uh, darkness uh, because of people being able to work longer and uh, be exposed to light that's uh, you know been where we've had the progression and worsening of uh, sleep issues now disturbed sleep can worsen your pain and this is a vicious cycle so pain prevents you from sleeping and not sleeping makes the pain worse. All of you must have observed that when you're not well rested at night, you feel that the pain worsens definitely during the daytime. The diagnosis and treatment of neuropathic pain may be complicated by conditions such as sleep disturbances, depression and anxiety, and a sleep onset insomnia. That is, when you're having difficulty falling asleep, sometimes can be due to anxiety, and the sleep fragmentation, which is disruption of sleep, can be due to chronic pain, which can lead to decreased tolerance for neuropathic pain. This is a, a little uh, to tell you about how pain is transmitted. So we have uh, the peripheral C fibers and the myelinated A fibers. And as you can see, they go up to the spinal cord through the dorsal ganglion, which is um, the posterior part, um, through the substantia gelatinosa. Again, these are just uh, uh, places in the spinal cord through which it ascends upwards. And the thalamus is the relay station for the ascending fibers. And it goes through the ventrolateral and postromedial nucleus of the thalamus. Uh, and then finally, it, you also see subroots into what we call the cingulate gyrus, which is uh, a part of the brain and uh, which is responsible for emotions, the limbic system, and then final radiations go to uh, the somatosensory area, which is uh, in medical, uh, we just grade it as area, Broadman area number three. So this is basically how pain is transmitted from the periphery, from the nerves, going up through the thalamus, finally shooting up into the cerebrum the, the, and uh, into these areas. And it's all very interlinked because the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is in the hypothalamus, is one of the areas where you also, when you have disruption in sleep, now suprachiasmatic uh, nucleus, it stimulates um, the hormone melatonin and uh, from the pineal gland, and that is what regulates your sleep wake. It is uh, important in regulating your sleep onset. Uh, the pain pathway also intermingles with that, and sometimes disruption of um, disruption of sleep can cause changes in the neurochemistry. You may have heard of transmitters like dopamine, serotonin, as well as endogenic uh, opioid receptors in the brain, which are usually in the periaqueductal area, which is, uh, you know, inside the brain, basically. These can cause reduced endogenous, that means your body's own endogenous uh, opioids and which can cause you to feel more pain. So that's how intimately if you have sleep disorders through these through these different pathways and through the way uh, the receptors work your sensation of pain is magnified. Coming to common sleep disorders 
Sleep, obstructive sleep apnea, this is one of the most common sleep disorders and this is seen like about 2% uh, of general population, um, 2 to 3% and uh, common symptoms are snoring and having pauses in breathing during sleep. Uh, patients in the morning, they are extremely tired, don't feel well rested, sometimes you have morning headaches, you feel you've been up all night. Uh, sleep apnea is graded in severity as the apnea hypopnea index. Apnea hypopnea index is basically the number of times per hour per night that you stop breathing for about 10 seconds or you have a decreased, a 50% decrease in breath. Treatment for sleep apnea is continuous positive airway pressure, which is like a splint to keep your airway from collapsing. So it is pressure externally that will prevent your airway from collapsing. Now sleep apnea is really very important because not only that you're not sleeping well, not only that you're not, uh, you know, you feel your pain is not well controlled, but sleep apnea is an independent risk factor for coronary artery disease, for heart disease, for strokes, for high blood pressure, for CHF. There was a very big sleep heart health study, which was in 2007, 2010, and this was uh, a landmark study bringing to uh, attention how important it is to sleep well and how important it is to treat these disorders. Now, uh, there were some studies a uh, lot, uh, there was in October 2006, uh, the study in the Clinical Journal of Pain and it evaluated sleep impairment associated with diabetic neuropathy. And sleep is really important because um, worsening of sleep can worsen your diabetes, which in turn can also worsen the neuropathy. And uh, also insulin resistance was found to be related to the severity of sleep apnea. So, you know, if you had severe sleep apnea, the chances of your diabetes getting worse and in turn worsening your neuropathy were, were you know, significantly high. Also, there was an independent study which did show that, you know, the decreased oxygen level in blood, the hypoxemia, which is the decreased oxygen level in blood, was an independent risk factor for damage of the peripheral nerves. Also, patients with neuropathy, some kinds of neuropathy can affect the autonomic nervous system. And this can cause worsening of arrhythmias, that is heart rhythms in patients with sleep apnea. So if you have sleep apnea and you have neuropathy, sometimes it can also affect, you know, which can cause serious cardiac uh, irregular rhythms. Another common disorder is restless leg syndrome, and neuropathies can cause secondary restless leg syndrome. And restless leg syndrome is basically when you feel an uncomfortable sensation in your feet, you feel that they are relieved by movement, they begin and worsen by rest and sitting around, and the symptoms are worse in evening or at night time. And this is again very important because not only neuropathy can cause secondary restless syndrome, but restless leg syndrome can cause nocturnal awakening arousals, and this can also affect your sleep, which in turn will worsen your ability uh, to cope with the neuropathy. This is just showing you the interrelationship between pain, sleep disturbance, anxiety, and depression, and they're very intimately linked. So, you know, pain can worsen sleep, sleep can worsen anxiety, depression, and, you know, so it's really important to treat all three. You know, while you're treating your neuropathic pain, also to treat sleep disorders and also to treat anxiety and depression, because one can influence the other and worsen the other and thereby causing functional impairment. Also, patients with neuropathy are usually on several medications. Um, opioids or narcotic medications sometimes are associated with a very high risk of central apneas, where you lose the respiratory drive 
to take a breath and which sometimes causes you to stop breathing at night. Drugs like tricyclics, nortriptyline, amitriptyline, that some of you may have used or are using, they suppress the REM sleep now and they decrease sleep latency. So sleep actually happens in stages. You go through N1, which is the light sleep, which progresses to N2 sleep, which is where you have sleep spindles and K complexes, and then N3 sleep, which is where you have the deep sleep or the restorative sleep, which is uh, usually, and this happens in cycles through the night. So you have stage one, two, three, REM. REM comes about 90 to 120 minutes, and then you have this repetition. But when you disrupt the architecture of sleep again, you know, and you suppress REM sleep, that can also, you know, affect the quality of sleep that you have. Drugs like SSRI, SNRI, drugs like Cymbalta, Duloxetine, which are also indicated in neuropathy, they can also suppress REM sleep. On another note, drugs like Gabapentin, Lyrica, Horizont, they increase the N3 sleep and they cause less sleep fragmentation. So you may have observed that if you're taking Gabapentin at night, you probably are sleeping better. So that's why, because it increases um, your N3 sleep and has been shown to reduce sleep fragmentation. Insomnia is a condition where you have difficulty in falling asleep or difficulty in staying asleep. Um, difficulty falling asleep can be related to anxiety or just inability to relax. And uh, there are different modalities to help with that. Cognitive behavioral therapy uh, definitely helps. I'm very holistic friendly. I like a form, a very ancient Indian technique called Nidra Yoga, which I'll be happy to go over later to kind of expose you all to it, is another me method to kind of help you to relax. Trying to go to sleep makes insomnia worse. You cannot will yourself to go to sleep. You know, you can't be say, sitting in bed and, you know, really trying to go to sleep. Your goal should never be to go to, you know, to go, to make yourself go to sleep. The only thing you can do is to learn to relax. Do not spend too much time in bed, not more than five to six hours, and don't watch the clock, okay? Have a regular bed schedule. Difficulty staying asleep is another disorder. You know, what we call sleep maintenance insomnia is usually due to a primary sleep disorder like either sleep apnea or restless leg or chronic pain, sometimes hot flushes for women. So things that can disrupt your continuity of sleep. Yes, question please. in bed, in bed. And this is basically for people who have insomnia who just think if I'm going to stay longer in bed, I'm going to feel better, I'm going to sleep more. This is for patients who sometimes say, oh, I didn't sleep enough, I'm just going to linger here longer and stay 10 hours in bed. So we're talking about that, not really. People, adequate amount of sleep is about seven hours and then, you know, it decreases with age, but we're not talking about that. It's just lying awake, in bed, trying to sleep and saying we're sleeping. It's time to get up there. <laughs> yes, sir. I read experiments where people were not permitted to enter the REM stage. Mm -hmm. And after a while, they refused to continue. They began hallucinating when they were awake. So if you take these medications that uh, inhibit the REM sleep, aren't there uh, I mean, there are side effects, you know, it's a risk-benefit. You do have uh, side effects with all medications, unfortunately. So it's just to be a little bit knowledgeable about what you're taking, you know. Uh, I mean, they do definitely help pain modulation and pain control, and that's why we use them. But, you know, just to let you know, from a sleep perspective, Lyrica, Gabapentin, Horizon are, you know, better choices in terms of affecting sleep architecture. Yes. <laughs> Sleep after. You can take Lyrica. I have really bad experience with Lyrica. What has been your experience with your patients as far as taking Lyrica? 
Uh, that is a very difficult in the sense, you know, uh, I feel all of us are so unique, you know, some people have great responses to the same drug and unfortunately, you know, we, we don't know why other people respond so well. So, you know, I would say, you know, just it's on the spectrum of, you know, I'm not sidelining one drug is good or better than the other. I'm just making you aware of what this does to your sleep architecture. We have, we have a lot of patients on Lyrica and they seem to do well too, as with all the other medications. And again, it's a risk benefit. We have to use those medications sometimes to control other symptoms. Yes, sir. Uh, I also have problems with that just five or six hours in bed. I've always heard and, and read even that senior citizens needed eight or nine hours of sleep and anything less than seven was unhealthy. So I, I don't understand just five or six max. Dr. Manchan, that you want to, he is the expert in geriatric uh, yeah. sleep, so. I, I, my specialization is geriatric sleep disorders. So uh, as we age, the um, amount of, uh, the, the, as uh, Dr. Das pointed out, the sleep is divided into two main stages. One is a non-REM sleep and the REM sleep. The non-REM sleep is further divided into three stages, the N1, N2, N3. As we age, the amount of N3 sleep, the slow wave sleep, declines. So, if you could get five hours of decent sleep, then that should be enough, generally speaking. But as, as she again pointed out, that we are not all equal. We are not. We all have different different genetic makeup. We um, and so this rule doesn't apply to everybody. But about eighty percent or so, eighty percent or so people, if they could get five hours of decent sleep, they should feel rested. You should not shoot for seven or eight hours of sleep above age 70. If you get five hours of decent sleep, that should be good enough. Generally speaking, again, your case might be slightly different. You might be somebody who's a long sleeper or you've always been a long sleeper, then you may need more. So in medicine, we, we can't make generalizations, but we can say, just from, from the literature that what percentage people benefit from what, what amount of sleep. So the, the data is that if you get 80% of the folks, if they get about five hours of decent sleep and the sleep architecture is maintained, means they get about 20% or so of the REM sleep, they get uh, about 5% or so of the stage one sleep and stage two sleep is around 50% or so and then you get a, uh, a, uh, a slow wave sleep, the N3 uh, stage of the sleep, about 20% or so. If the sleep architecture is maintained, five hours should be decent. Yeah, but again, may not apply to you. It's just, these are just numbers that, yes. That's very interesting. So the N3 becomes shorter as you age. Right. I have two questions. One, do we know why the N3 becomes shorter? And second, if a young person, could they decrease the N3 and then reduce their sleep requirements? So, uh, the reason, uh, again, um, the data as to why the slow wave sleep declines with aging is uh, some of it is art. any sort of pain increases the stage 2 sleep. It decreases the stage 3 sleep. It also decreases the REM sleep to an extent. So if you are in pain for any reason, if you have arthritis, if you have back pain, neck pain, shoulder hurting, that would uh, alter the sleep architecture. So you will have lesser of slow wave sleep and you will have more of stage 2 sleep instead of stage 3 sleep, which is the deep sleep. So that is one pain point. Is causing the pain is most likely Penis, yes, the pain would... that's disrupting the sleep And also I think it's the cerebral neuron density as you decrease with time, uh, with aging, may also have a role to play in uh, sleep architecture. So the second part is very much this, that the sleep generator in the brain is the uh, hypothalamus, the suprachiasmic nucleus that she had mentioned recently. So as we age, the brain is shrinking. That is normal physiological thing. But in certain people, the sleep centers are shrinking more than the other part. And so in them, you would have more of sleep disruptions with aging 
compared with other people. And the why this happens, we don't really know why in some people this part is specifically affected and not the periphery. Why is it the central part around the hypothalamus that's affected? We don't know. We don't know why that happens. So uh, still a lot of research has to go into it, but the, these are the observations from the large volume of data that we have accumulated. You have to see that sleep is relatively a nascent field. Nobody really knew about, people thought that the sleep is just a homogeneous state. You go to bed and you wake up and Nobody knew that the sleep is divided into so many stages. Each state has its own function. Now we know much more about it. We know that if you don't get enough of stage three sleep or the deep sleep, your memory will get affected. If you don't get REM sleep, your procedural memory, like if you, um, like procedural memory is the memory that comes, it's a motor memory, like people learning how to bike. If you teach them and they get enough of REM sleep, they'll do better than somebody who just didn't sleep and kept biking throughout the night they wouldn't do that well because you need that sleep to, to consolidate your procedural memory. So lots of things, lots of data in the sleep is relatively new. Still an evolving thing. Yeah, most of the studies are like in, within subject. the last 15 years or so. With the discovery of REM sleep was in 1955. The humanity has been around for so many years and until 1955 they didn't know that there's a REM sleep also. So it's all so new and so much information is coming. In the last 15 years, huge amount of data, a huge amount of data has come out. We know that if you do pre-sleep apnea, the risk of stroke, the risk of heart disease, the risk of uh, uh, memory problems, the risk of uh, cardiac arrhythmias, the diabetes, uh, uh, depression, all these things are new. All these things are new. 15 years ago, nobody talked about it. Now people talk about sleep. Things yes, ma'am, you had a question? I understood the five or six hours. If you've got that much sleep and you wake up, to go ahead and get up, not to lay in bed. And not that you would set the alarm for five or six hours. Exactly. Okay, that's it, what I'm talking about. Yes, right. yes. That's very true. Thank you. That's. So now, if you're not falling asleep in 15 to 20 minutes, uh, go to another room. Don't just lie there in the same room hoping to fall asleep. Try progressive muscle relaxation, which is a technique where you use, um, you know, sleep therapists. Are you suggesting men and wife not sleep together? <laughs> <laughs> never, <laughs> no, no, I'm not suggesting that. <laughs> there is, if you, you know, if you laugh, the world laughs with you. But if you snore, you do sleep alone. <laughs> So progressive muscle relaxation, breathing techniques, and I can, I'll be going over a couple breathing techniques with you. Sit in an easy chair, turn on soft light to read. Avoid the computer or media, as there, there's a joke which said, you know, I don't have insomnia, I just have internet connection. So, <laughs> you know, and you might like to play some soft music, and your goal is to do something quiet and relaxing. Sleep habits that can help, and these are from your handouts that should be on the, you know, uh, to reflect on. Basically, sticking to regular bedtime routine, getting up at the same time every day, avoiding caffeine and alcohol, um, getting daily exercise, making your bedroom quiet and dark. Pets which are disruptive should be sleeping in another room. Keeping the temperature of the room cool because when you when sleep onset occurs, it actually, the temperature drops to initiate sleep. Avoiding electronics before bedtime, uh, you know, that means no phones, no media, no iPads, at least one to two hours before bedtime. Uh, the blue light from the media, the blue light is extremely disruptive to sleep, and this can actually suppress endogenous melatonin. So there are some filters that you can wear. Some apps on, on the market are also available that you can have on your iPhone, iPad to reduce blue light exposure. And there are sunglasses that you can wear. Actually, we do recommend wearing these orange sunglasses uh, that can block the, the blue wave frequency. There are a lot of those products on the market. Ideally, we'd say don't just use media two hours before bedtime. 
This is again sleep hygiene, that is, you know, avoiding napping during the day, avoid stimulants like caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, too close to bedtime. While alcohol can cause you to feel sleepy, what alcohol does is also suppress REM. And when it suppress REM, REM comes back. Now REM is your dream stage of sleep. REM comes back with a vengeance and that's why it causes disruption and that's why it causes all that dreaming, early morning hours with sleep when you, you know, when you drink too much. Exercise is also excellent for sleep, but don't get into that vigorous exercise mode one hour before bedtime. So, you know, I recommend relaxing kind of exercises like yoga just before bedtime and, um, you know, vigorous exercise or exercise as tolerated earlier in the day. Food can also be disruptive, stay away from really large meals and, um, you know, avoid experimenting with caffeine or chocolate has a lot of caffeine. So just be watchful of, you know, things that would cause you to disrupt your sleep later. Ensure adequate exposure to natural light. You know, as we've talked about, you know, it's so important for the natural light, for your sleep-wake cycle, for the circadian rhythm, especially when you're not exposed to natural light, you know, as, you, as we grow older, and sometimes we're not out as much. This is really important to get that natural light exposure and really avoid light during the nighttime. Um, light exposure helps maintain a healthy sleep-wake cycle. Establish a relaxing bedtime routine. You know, we don't want you bringing problems to bed or having that fight just right before bedtime. Time it for the morning. <laughs> so, you know, it's just uh, avoid anything that will be emotionally disturbing to you so that it's just your time to relax, that special time that you've taken to relax. Associate your bed with sleep. You know, um, we don't really recommend watching TV or listening to the radio or reading in bed. You know, we just want you to minimize anything that's stimulating, disturbing, the, you know, which will affect your sleep. So basically, again, is to, you know, having light exposure during the daytime, the sunlight and darkness affects your sleep clock in the hypothalamus, that is the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which again regulates melatonin by the pineal gland, which establishes your circadian rhythm. Consider timing drugs like gabapentin at nighttime, and, you know, just talk to your doctor about other medications you're taking, as a lot of drugs do affect your um, sleep architecture, you know, and sometimes you do have to take them, but sometimes timing them right or, you know, minimizing uh, drugs that are disruptive to your sleep can uh, enable you to sleep better. So good laugh and long sleep are the two best cures for anything. And uh, thank you so much and uh, thank you for having us. And if you have any further questions, uh, we'd be happy to take them now. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I particularly noticed that I'm uh, getting worse with my memory, and I noticed you mentioned it was in the N3 cycle. So are there any of these things that specifically would address a particular part of the sleep, or you need to do all of them to affect the whole cycle of everything? Do you know what I'm saying? Let's say it again. I, I'm so trying to so um, I'm noticing my memory. You know, there are a lot of reasons for memory. Right. right. Yeah. I have too much in here. That's the uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it's not the but it so if you when you're doing all these things to improve your sleep, is right. it to improve the whole cycle of sleep, or is there ever a reason you would try to do something that would affect only one of those cycles? One stage or the other. Yes. So you first of all you need to know your sleep architecture. So you would need to know what percentage of sleep you are having because you can't just attribute memory problem to the sleep architecture. You got to see if you're having memory problems, is it really the, due to the affected sleep architecture? If that it happens to be the case, then yes, an effort should be made to correct the sleep architecture. And in that case, lots of the most common, the most common cause of uh, disruptive sleep architectures are medications. So we got to see which, even the medication that we use for blood pressure, they increase this, uh, the stage two sleep. So lots of the medications. So you got to know exactly what medications you are taking. So you can, as she mentioned, you can adjust the timing of the medications. 
certain blood pressure medications work for 24 hours. You can take lisinopril in the morning, but some people take it in the night. So we should tell them not to take it in the night, take it in the morning. So the medications that have a half-life of more than 16 hours, those can be taken in the morning instead of taking in the night. And then that may alter the sleep architecture. So the goal should always be to get to the ideal sleep architecture. But uh, again, sleep might be just one of the components. You can correct one thing, but memory is much broader issue than that. Memory is four different stages, involves different areas of the brain. The initial registration part is in the same area where the sleep uh, is generated from. The rest of the three stages are in a different part of the brain. So you got to know which part of the brain is getting involved. So all memory problems are not the same. Different, different sleep disorders. I mean, these are all, uh, you know, things that you can do on your own. That is your sleep hygiene and sleep habits. You know, talking to your physician about medications and all of these things are a lot of things are, you know, which you can help yourself to sleep better. And then there are things that are primary sleep disorders, as we talked about, you know, sleep apnea, which has its own treatment, restless leg, chronic pain, anxiety. So it really depends what is causing the sleep fragmentation, which is affecting your sleep. So addressing the cause of the root cause of the problem will help you to have better sleep. And definitely we know without doubt that if you're sleeping better, your memory is definitely going to be better. Yes. So many of the meds for neuropathy make you sleepy mm -hmm. and you take them through the day. So midday or whatever, you may need to take a nap or you think you do, which then, as you said, can disrupt the sleep thing. How do you either stop taking that nap and then deal with that, or is there a good way to nap that would not disrupt your sleep at night? Uh, that, you know, there are two different approaches. Ideally, I would have liked, you know, uh, there are forms of longer acting, like for, let's take an example of gabapentin that you take during the morning, makes you sleepy, then you have that nap. There are longer preparations of gabapentin. The drug Horizont is once a day dosing. So, you know, uh, again, I'm not a speaker for any of the drugs or not recommending one, but, uh, you know, these are basically, they are, I mean, people had that issue and that's why they're thinking about having once a day a longer acting formulation that you would take at a particular time so that, you know, it would not be disruptive to your sleep architecture. Now, having said that, now once, if you are taking a medicine that does cause you to feel sleepy during the day, you know, ideally our goal is to try to do something that would prevent you from sleeping and, you know, try to, you know, keep yourself active, have a regular schedule, you know, physical activity of any form that can be stimulating. Yes, that would be a good time to watch TV. So, you know, <laughs> you know, just anything, uh, you know, to keep yourself from sleeping basically uh, so that you're, um, you know, you're able to have a better sleep cycle later at night. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a couple of things. You mentioned the yellow sunglasses mm -hmm. blocking the blue light. Uh, yes, orange. I, yes. I'm not, I was, uh, would like some clarification on uh, when you use those. I haven't heard of them before. Can you... Uh, read with them on? Do you yes, you can do them? everything with them on. You know, the light that you have, like the regular light that we have, is also like about 400 to 500 lux. So it's all, you know, all these kind of different light exposures at night time can definitely cause, um, you know, disruption in your melatonin production. And the blue light is the worst of them. So basically these kind of glasses, they're like filter effect and they filter the blue light. They are different, they're different, they're, uh, if you, you know, they're available on Amazon, they call Zen glasses, they are very reasonably priced. So they're different kind of glasses, again, they're different forms of them, but the principle is basically blocking that blue light and you can do everything wearing them. So you just look like, you know, you have sunglasses in bed. Or, you know, you go out to read something, you'll be wearing sunglasses. So, you know, it's just a different form of trying to avoid the blue light exposure, especially if you're doing media. And ideally, we don't want you to be doing media or watching TV or watching your iPad or your phone one to two hours before bedtime. But those are electronic gadgets which emit blue light, which is what you want to block. 
So two hours before bedtime would be ideal. Okay. Uh, another thing, I may have missed it, but I did not hear you say anything about uh, uh, Zolpidem or Ambient, and I've heard different stories about uh, how good the, that is and the side effects and how long you should take it. Yes, that, that, that is a whole, um, you're going into the treatment of insomnia or medical drugs to treat insomnia. Again, there are so many of them on the market, each with their different side effect profile. So, you know, basically, um, ideally, I do not like too much medication to sleep because my goal as a sleep specialist is to try to get you off those sleep medicines and try to sleep naturally. To be, you know, and if you had to take them, I really recommend reducing them to at least one to three times, uh, you know, once every three days. So really, we have cognitive therapies to help, and drugs like Ambien help with sleep onset insomnia, patients who have difficulty falling asleep. A lot of time, there are other conditions. It's sometimes pain, and sometimes anxiety. So treating the root cause so that, you know, that will facilitate Plus, they have habit-forming potential. Sometimes they can have risk of falls. Now, again, if you're not sleeping for several days and it's really, you know, very difficult for you, I will put you on those drugs, but my goal would be to minimize them to be able for you to sleep on your own. So the medication per se does not affect the sleep architecture, but it's not good to take it long-term because it loses its effectiveness. So... Uh, not a good idea to take it. And some people, side effects, uh, some people do have this uh, sleep walking or they do stuff after taking the medication in the sleep, they would get around and uh, wouldn't even know that. So that's the major worry with that, with the use of that medication for long time. Yes. You always hear that people who snore may have sleep apnea should get it checked out. How many people are really chronic snorers but don't have sleep apnea? So primary sleep soda, take that again. So there's something called primary snoring, where you don't have sleep apnea and you just snore. Generally, that is uh, that the chances of having just that and not sleep apnea would be few things. The length would, would be few things that you have to look in the in the uh, anatomy because if there is any, uh, you have to look into the throat. We have certain classification systems to see what's the structure of the throat because uh, if there is crowding of the, we call the posteropharyngeal area, this crowding of those structures there, then it's most likely that snoring is not just simple snoring. It's probably associated with the drop in the oxygen saturations of more than 4% or it's causing you to have uh, pauses in the breathing of more than 10 seconds or so, which is called apnea. So physical body structure can help you in uh, refining those categories, whether it's a primary snoring disorder or whether it's a sleep apnea, you check the circumference of the neck, you check those structures, or sometimes we just check the body tone. You can check the, the tone of the musculature. That gives you some idea at times whether this would really be sleep apnea or just simple snoring. And also another tip would be if you're snoring, of course, but you see somebody snoring and then gasping for breath that becomes more suggestive of sleep apnea. Right. Or, you know, where they have, they're reaching out, you know, you suddenly hear them like that crescendo of snoring and suddenly it pauses, that is what is worrisome. If you snore but don't have apnea, is that still affecting your quality of sleep or is it just one of those things? It will definitely affect the quality of sleep of your sleep partner. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, there you but, go. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's mutual. It's mutual. <laughs> it's mutual. <laughs> okay. The, 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 uh, what we do is, we, in scientific studies, you always correlate with the degree of uh, abnormality with a, certain, so you, with a certain condition. You try to assign causality causality based on what percentage or to what degree this would affect the, 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 the comorbid conditions. The study on primary snoring was between primary snoring and cardiovascular disease. The data was there that primary snoring does increase the risk for cardiovascular disease, but 
it was much lesser in degree compared to having sleep apnea that really um, caused much worsening of the cardiovascular system. So primary snoring, there is some data to it, but uh, so far the risk has not been uh, that high or it has not been established to that point. Um, again, as I said, it's a relatively nascent field, uh, not still things are uh, in the process, well, maybe another five years we'll have more data on that. But right now, primary snorers, uh, the, uh, right now there's no, no major um, uh, data to, to show that this increases the risk for other. Are, are you suggesting that she quit complaining and wait five years? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Did I say that? No. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, alpha lipoic is uh, one of the most common supplements used for neuropathy, from what I hear. Does that affect sleep at all? Um, that would be hard to, I do not believe, I'm at least not aware of any specific studies. And a lot of the problems with supplements, I'm very holistic friendly, I like, you know, uh, things like magnesium and you know natural uh, aids to help with medications or minimizing medicines but you know that's the problem with supplements that is they have not been studied as effectively you would have had to had you know where these supplements people on supplements have sleep studies to know their sleep architecture but unfortunately since they you know they are not studied your you know a lot of un I would say limited data is available as far as supplements so um, you know, unfortunately. And it's not just the primary compound, it's the binding agents that people use. Because each, each uh, company comes up with its own binding agent and brings about its own product. So if you just do the alpha lipoic acid, it's a different deal, but it's bound to so many other things. And what impact that has on the sleep is unclear. Or on neuropathy, for that matter, it's unclear. So, for example, let's say uh, even uh, Omega threes, and uh, we know that uh, for ADHD, that uh, there is some data to affect that omega threes do help. But then there is more data for krill oil versus other uh, kinds of oils because that points to phosphatidylserine serine, and the brain has more of phosphatidylserine serine, and so the absorption is higher. There. So it varies. It, it, it depends on what the binding compound is, and uh, there is not much research. You, people don't do the research with one single compound. Each even if you see lots of data on alpha lipoic acid, if you really dig deep into it, you'll find that they, one study used a different compound, the other side study used a different compound. So it's the same, one major element will be the same, but there'll be seven other things in that pill which would not match. So you can't and No compare. standardized dosing, no standardized form, and lack of uh, you know, randomized controlled trials to give us evidence-based medicine, unfortunately. You know, we, we spend almost one third of our lives sleeping, and it would be nice to find some useful way of using that time. And, uh, I've read the scientists who discovered the structure of benzene actually came up with that solution in, in a dream, a dream of the snake. And uh, they used to look at dreams as messages from the gods and ancient cultures, and Freud and Jung based their therapies on interpreting dreams, and Jung even wrote his autobiography called Memories, Dreams, nice. and Reflection, because he placed such importance on it. And I think in yoga there's a technique of being able to fall asleep and maintain consciousness. Yes, and uh, yeah, actually, if you'll, uh, I wanted to expose this, uh, you know, again, this is not the ideal setting. I would like you all to be in mats and, you know, uh, do this with a certified yoga therapist. But we do have, I'm very, I do like inculcating all these alternated modalities to help, you know, treat patients, especially with insomnia and, uh, you know, just um, as you very uh, rightly mentioned, Nidra Yoga is a very ancient Indian technique, which is, uh, you know, about they stay awake, basically they kind of tell you that you are to keep awake, but really get into a very restful state. And this is, you know, it, it's very similar to cognitive behavioral therapies of insomnia too, where they first, because a lot of times the stress about falling asleep is usually the thing you have to get by. 
So you take that away straight away in Nidra Yoga by saying, by telling the patient or, you know, telling you all that, you know, the goal here is not to sleep but to relax. So if you would like, and again, um, this is not recommended if you have heart diseases where your heart rate can come down um, or seizures where, you know, or seizures we've got about by breathing, you know, uh, different types. If you're, you know, I would like to probably try about 10 minutes and we can interrupt this at any time. If, you know, you're not feeling good, just, uh, you know, uh, just to give you a little sample of what Nidra Yoga is. Would you like to do that? Would you like to proceed at this time? Okay. So for that, there's one thing on that. We should stop thinking of time wasted while sleeping. It's not the time wasted. It is, as they say, the old thing is that if you have to make any, any uh, difficult decision or you have to uh, think about all the variables, you better sleep over it and make the decision the next day. And there is a sense in that because what happens is when you get all these data points, you take them to a certain part of the brain. In, during stage 3 sleep, all the neurons fire at the same frequency, they fire at the same amplitude. If you look at the EEG, it's very synchronous. So those dots get connected better. So in the morning when you get out, you have a better understanding, having the same information to, that you had the night before, but now the decision making becomes much clearer because you are able to connect those data points. So it's not time wasted as we sign to use that. So that's, yes, that I definitely, you know, as two sleep specialists will tell you that that's the most well spent time. As I get over that feeling, oh, I wasted that much time. And there's always this talk of, uh, I don't know, this guy was talking about how to curtail the sleep and get by with just three hours of sleep, four hours of sleep, and there's uh, uh, the, the different techniques they try to decrease the amount of stage three sleep or. Uh, give you a uh, mega doses of one sleep during this time and then give you two hours of uh, rest and then give all that. I think these are few patients that they do their research on, but if you generalize it to the public, I think it's probably a very bad idea. It's one should always see sleep as a time used well because it is good for your growth. It's good for your uh, immunity. It prevents you from having infections. Prevents, it even prevents some aging also. The sleep is a good thing. I didn't really mean it's wasted. I, I meant is there a way to use it more efficiently, more effectively? Well, so that you can sleep. work with your dreams and... Oh, we and take it to the next level. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> well, sleep hygiene to start with. All those things to help you which do not disrupt your sleep. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, one of your slides said it's best not to read in bed if you want to go to sleep, but uh, just to comment, I normally don't, but last week when I got ready for bed, I wanted to read this article. So I, with the halogen light on and my eyeglasses, my highlighter in my hand, I started reading this article and it wasn't very long. The next thing I knew, it was two hours later and the halogen light was still on and the magazine was by my side. So uh, I don't know if that made me go to sleep or not. Yes, of course, you know, what you're reading does make a difference. But the goal here is to associate your bed with sleep. So a lot of times if you start working in bed, your mind and body automatically associate it with you know, uh, uh, work or with reading or with something else that you're doing. So all this is to set the scene, to kind of get your body, know this is time in bed, time for me to relax. And you know, recommend reading that article every night. So <laughs> don't take and read that article. That was the best thing to do. Right, I, I just want to make a comment. It's not a, um, you know, medical article, it's anything, but uh, have we thought about uh, younger days when we were in school, and you know, our parents would be asking, you know, study for it and don't sleep. And we fall asleep, you know, we, it's so difficult for us to keep yeah. awake uh, and either, either to get up in the morning to go to school or, uh, you know, study in the night. But here we are after so many years, now we are talking about how to fall asleep. <laughs> and maybe you went back to your student days when you were reading that article, no, I want to sleep. <laughs> so, 
just never know. Def no, no. Definitely, it's the anxiety about falling asleep that is a problem. So a lot of times when people are stressed about falling asleep, where you actually remove those things when you're a student, your goal is not to fall asleep. So you're automatically reducing that anxiety about falling asleep. So maybe that's how it helped, you know. <laughs> so uh, yoga nidra, uh, I would um, just recommend getting uh, into a comfortable pose, uh, sitting um, maybe with your...